great fun here. You know, I mean, the, the colors, are, colors are out there, and we could all be outside enjoying the sunshine. But of course we're not. In fact, if you visited the real America recently, you'll notice that uh, there are other things happening in the land. One of which is that under our great uh, abundance, do we have a pointer here? Oh, yes. Under our great abundance, we have, uh, in fact, created a rather interesting variant of the species. Now, as um, Malcolm was just saying, this has got nothing to do with genetics. It's all happened in the last 25 years. And it's a cultural shift which has created for us a whole new way of thinking about the human body. So what I'm going to tell you about is some of my thoughts as a neuroscientist. I grew up in England, came here about 30 years ago now, and I've been fascinated by America because it is indeed the great experiment of the Enlightenment. Now this is where we thought the rational concepts of Europe were going to be put in place and it was going to work like a charm. In fact, it has worked, but it hasn't worked quite the way we thought it did. So, as we come now to a reflection, which we must do, rather than thinking we have the perfect society on the planet, there are certain things we have to keep in mind. And what I'm going to do is take you through a little bit about the brain, a little bit about how markets work, if you think about them from the standpoint of a neuroscientist, and then something about the addictive cycle, which is the Dorito cycle that we heard about earlier. So the brain is actually three brains. There's the lizard brain, the gecko brain, the one that eats its young and in fact is extraordinarily competitive and territorial. And then there's the other on top of it, which came about at the beginning of the dinosaur era, which is the furry mammals. We have a lot of that in us. They actually are attached to their children, but they don't think a great deal about the future. And then you've got the human brain, which is only about 200,000 years old, believe it or not. We're a very recent species. And it's just this little tiny part above your eyes which makes us human. This is the frontal lobe, the executive lobe, the sort of thing that allows you to turn poverty into opportunity, as Malcolm was talking about it. Well, when we are in danger, it's this system that works for us. When you put your hand on a hot stove, you don't think about it, you take it away immediately. What I'm going to suggest to you is that abundance does the same thing. It's only during scarcity that we actually use the human intelligence to the effect that we can use it. And think about that. We managed to come out of a period of great turmoil in the planetary climate. A couple of hundred thousand years ago, we started to migrate out of Africa about 80,000 years ago. We're now all over the planet. And we're doing all sorts of crazy things to the planet, as we were hearing again and again in this conference. But the fact is that that particular behavior came out of scarcity. It was during that period of time when we were constrained and we had to be innovative that we began to do the creative things of which PopTech is a perfect example in terms of its evolution. So, in fact, that reptilian area is what the, account, what the accountants and the economists would call a short-term discounting. We are much more fixed on the future, immediate future, than we are on the long-term future. It's very difficult to get us away from thinking about the present. In fact, if you don't believe that, tonight at dinner, when you're faced with your chocolate cake, your cortex will tell you, well, I've had so much good food at PopTech, I probably shouldn't eat it all, but most of us will. In fact, that's a very interesting point made by Malcolm II, which is that the, if you put a marshmallow in front of a child, you know this, you know this uh, study probably, and then you say, I'm leaving the room for a little while, I'll be back. But if you don't eat the marshmallow before I come back, we'll give you two. About 40% of kids can manage to survive the challenge of having that marshmallow in front of them. They're the ones who, 10 years later, do extremely well in terms of academic and social 
prowess. It's that constraint, it's the use of the frontal lobe which enables us to keep ourselves from this profligate uh, experience that we've been having here in the US in the last 25 years. How does this work? We have to go to markets. Markets are a natural evolution of human social behavior. There's nothing particularly curious about them. We didn't invent them, they just happened. Adam Smith, of course, who was a professor of moral philosophy and basically a psychologist, wrote an important book, the, the Moral Sentiments book, and then later wrote the book which is famous, The Wealth of Nations, published in an important year, 1776. In that book, he basically said that you can create a human economy by allowing individuals to do what they want to do that self-interest will drive the interest of the whole society. So if you reduce it to this cartoon, on one side, what he calls self-love, what we call self-interest, drives the market. There are three engines to the market. Self-interest, curiosity, very, very important. Why do you think we have all this technology around us? Because we're fascinated. It's going to be very difficult to make a Nokia last for 25 years. I had one that's nine years old, but... Everybody wants a new gizmo. It wants to be able to take pictures of yourself while you're actually listening to somebody talk to you. I mean, the whole thing, it needs to be pink. It needs to be green. I mean, the fact is that we are hooked on curiosity. Smith knew that in those days when the watch was coming in. He pointed out that a person who spends five guineas on a watch or 50 guineas on a watch, neither of them are necessarily on time. It's got nothing to do with the watch. And, of course, the other thing is the social ambition. Now, if you just look at some of this, you find that the human brain, these three parts of the brain are actually yoked together by a series of superhighways. The most important one, because we're not flush for time today, to think about is the reward pathway. Now, the reward pathway comes up from the base of the brain and goes around and arborizes through that frontal cortex. But it also connects with the issue of the amygdala, which is the fear center. This is the one that in danger saves us. That's the one that takes your hand away from the hot stove. These systems are very easily hijacked, and they're also very easily addicted. And those are the systems that the market tunes in with. So these guys may look a little different from what we are, but they're not. They are using the same brain as we use when we work in the market. Self-interest, curiosity, risk-taking, competing for resources, as you heard. We're competing for those fish in the sea. We're killing them all off. And this is very important, social ambition. We always want a little more than we have. It's the old business of being at the trough first. Now, think about that. You know, the old joke is that what's a happy man? The man who earns a little more than his brother-in-law, yeah? but it goes throughout our society and America has made a cultural icon of that. So we are in fact constantly upgrading. Our current housing market is a perfect example of how more is never enough. Let's look at the other side of this equation because don't forget this is supposed to be a balance. This is a system which he uh, Smith called the invisible hand. It's not magic, it's not invisible, it's really two hands. It's the engine and at the other side, it's the constraint. The constraint, in Smith's mind, was social sympathy. Now, you might think that's sort of silly. How could that be constraining? Well, he argued in this Enlightenment uh, beginning that, in fact, it was the way in which all of us wanted to be together. We wanted to be liked by other people, and it was that liking by other people that constrained us. We didn't want to do anything that annoyed somebody. You don't want to sell bad meat because nobody will come back to you. And in fact, that whole element to him was the brake on the engine. He argued it so successfully that in fact people still believe it, that there are free markets. But let me tell you how it's changed. First of all, how does it work? See this picture here? This young baby, eight months old, is looking at me. I'm taking a photograph. She likes the flash. Her mother is looking at her. 
the uh, brother is looking at his sister, the aunt is looking at the brother, etc., etc. Everybody is looking at everybody else for obviously good reasons. All of you can immediately tell who won the competition. <laughs> Miss Teenage America 1972. This woman is about... Oh, wonderful. This young lady is about to dissolve into tears. That is a fundamental ability that we all have in the same way as we can distinguish red from white from blue. It's fundamentally wired into the brain, but it is culturally dependent. If you put somebody's head in a scanner and ask them to, to imagine this or to imitate this picture, then when you imitate it, your motor cortex begins to light up. When you imagine it, just observe it, it disappears. The, the, it, the, the activity drops. However, there is a part of the brain in front of this, the premotor cortex, which when you ask that experiment to be run again, during imitation, it can 